His terrorist plot would be the opening salvo in the attacks on America. Ramzi Yusuf assembled the chemicals, he built the bomb, drove down into the basement of the World Trade Center. Ramzi Yusuf got out of the van, just left the building. We have received reports of an explosion at the World Trade Center. Ramzi Yusuf had attacked America on its own soil and given the country a deadly glimpse of things to come. This was the future, and the future was here. Ramzi Youssef wasn't satisfied with the carnage that he wreaked. He wanted more. They absolutely had to capture this guy to prevent a major atrocity. Osama bin Laden's terror network. Cowards who committed this crime. Forgive Justice for these killers will be swift. Dead or alive, we're going to get him. February 26, 1993, 12.18 p.m. An explosion has rocked the earth beneath New York's World Trade Center, bringing the city to its knees. Nobody really thought, initially anyway, that it was a bomb. Simon Reeves' bestseller, The New Jackals, accounts the first blow struck directly against America in what would become a war on terror. The first emergency crews were on the scene within minutes of the explosion. Um, the FBI arrived within about 50 minutes to half an hour. We had police, we had fire department vehicles, we had ambulance, so that the streets were becoming clustered. We ended up leaving the uh, car on a side street and uh, ran to the uh, World Trade Center. We're monitoring the radio, we're hearing some of the calls coming in, and we're getting a heightened sense of urgency. Rescue workers arrive within moments. 9-11 was being deluged with calls from people on upper floors uh, in the building indicating that they needed rescue. The emergency service officer rappelled down from a helicopter to the roof, cut down antennas, and uh, subsequently allowed the helicopters to land on the roof and evacuate people who needed to get out of that building. The explosion claims six lives and injures over 1,000. For the FBI, the World Trade Center is treated as a vast crime scene. The investigation into the explosion began within moments. Neil Herman leads the FBI's Joint Terrorist Task Force. Within an hour of the explosion, we had a command post set up in Lower Manhattan as well as at the FBI office at 26 Federal Plaza. Street level, around the World Trade Center, there was buckling of the ground. Uh, there was tremendous amount of smoke coming from the building. Before the smoke clears, an investigative team descends into the carnage beneath the Trade Center. We were able to see the shells of the cars in the parking garages that had been completely uh, blown out. There were over 300 cars that had been destroyed. Though initial reports indicate a transformer explosion, the scale of the damage rules out any accident. There was such a massive amount of debris, it took on a different dimension, a different scale that we really hadn't seen before. Uh, I entered the basement, the smell in the air indicated to me that what we had here was some sort of a bomb. The bomb that he used in the World Trade Center bomb was the World Trade Center was the only one that they knew of in 73,000 recorded yeah. explosions. It was a very, very specific, well put together device. We didn't know who had perpetrated the bombing. Uh, people were scared. Uh, the, the city was scared. It was the start of a new phenomenon. It wasn't something that just happened in, in London or Beirut or the Philippines. It could happen any place. Finding clues amid the rubble would be next to impossible. The first major breakthrough in the investigation came when uh, FBI agents at the scene of Ground Zero discovered part of the vehicle chassis of the van that had been used to transport the bomb into the building. Miraculously, the VIN, or Vehicle Identification Number, is still legible on the manifold. We were able then to begin tracing where the vehicle came from and who was the registrant of that vehicle. And once that was determined, we were off to the races. The VIN is traced to a rider truck rental facility directly across the Hudson River in Jersey City. We set up surveillance and began tracing the vehicle's last known drivers. 
they were able to go to this vehicle rental facility in New Jersey and establish exactly who'd rented the vehicle. An individual by the name of Mohammed Salome. The next lucky break for the FBI came when Salome had actually been stupid enough to return to the vehicle rental facility and try and claim back his deposit. Thinking the truck would be eviscerated in the blast, Salome returns on March 4th for his deposit, claiming the vehicle was stolen. An agent posed as the rider employee. The agent gives him the $400 back. He's, the last thing he says before he's going out the door is, now this is justice. And then he walks outside and our agents outside swoop down on him and place him under arrest. Well, after they'd managed to get Mohammed Salome, then the dominoes really began to fall. He had phone numbers, he had addresses. Um, he revealed uh, some of the locations of uh, where some of the other conspirators had been saying. There were a number of safe houses that came to our attention from the information from Mohammed Salome. And the FBI quickly raided those, and they were able to round up um, three or four of the, the central figures in the plot. March 5th, an anonymous tip alerts the FBI to a nearby storage facility in Jersey City. We went in and they saw all these chemicals. It was a storage locker where most of the chemicals uh, that were used to construct the bomb had been delivered. They discovered all sorts of bomb manuals and how to build explosives and things like that. The FBI finds numerous fingerprints of Salome and the other suspects, and just two of someone who had been much more careful. After they began uh, questioning them, it soon became clear that there was a mastermind behind this. As the FBI begins tapping phone lines and dumping names into its pattern searching computers, one name keeps raising red flags. A young Kuwaiti-born Pakistani man called Ramzi Youssef. Very quickly we began to see that Ramzi Youssef was everywhere in this case. He was the straw that stirred the drink, so to speak, in, in this bombing of the World Trade Center. April 2nd, 1993, the FBI expands its 10 most wanted list to 11 to accommodate Ramzi Youssef. Interrogation of his co-conspirators reveals that Ramzi Youssef is planning more terrorist strikes. It was really a time bomb waiting to happen. They absolutely had to capture this guy to prevent a major atrocity. April 2nd, 1993. The FBI launches its hunt for the most wanted man alive terrorist Ramzi Youssef. There was just a massive investigation. It literally went to uh, all corners of the world uh, trying to, to track him down. During the investigation into the World Trade Center bombing, it became clear that Ramzi Youssef was quite possibly the most dangerous terrorist uh, alive in, in the world at that time. They had the name Ramzi Youssef, but they didn't know much about the guy initially. To help put the pieces together, the FBI turns to one of law enforcement's best-kept secrets, the DSS, the U.S. State Department's Diplomatic Security Service. We have the ties overseas to the law enforcement bodies in each and every country that we have an embassy uh, that no other federal law enforcement agency has. And because of those ties, we can trace leads, we can get information, we can request assistance that no one else can. Mike Evanoff is the DSS top security man in Pakistan. Diplomatic security is the uh, law enforcement security arm to provide uh, protection for U.S. diplomacy in this country. Their main job is really the protection of the embassy or the consulate where they're operating. Through forged alliances with local law enforcement agencies throughout the world, the DSS is firmly positioned on the front lines of the terror war. No other federal law enforcement agency in the United States has more agents assigned overseas than anywhere else in the world than we do. We can live and thrive and be successful in a hostile environment. DSS agents were among the first investigators on the scene of the Trade Center bombing. We had agents in New York that thought there might be an overseas angle. And from there, we became a partner with ATF and FBI in going after the bombers. 
The DSS helps the FBI trace Yousef's trail from his initial departure from Pakistan. Ramzi Yousef entered uh, the United States the, the year prior to the World Trade Center bombing. He just turned up at uh, John F. Kennedy Airport. Ramzi Yousef was stopped for a short period of time at the airport in New York. He was claiming political asylum. Uh, and he had been detained by INS, fingerprinted and photographed, and then released. Yousef's asylum request is the first stage of his plan to attack the U.S. for its support of Israel. America was involved in supporting the Israelis, both financially and militarily, against the Palestinians. Ramsey's grandmother lived in Haifa. He was part Palestinian. And when you can't attack uh, your enemy, you attack the friend of your enemy. I think for him it was an ego trip, his ability to, to actually take war to America. Youssef begins to assemble a terrorist cell among the zealous followers of Sheikh Omar Rahman. Sheikh Rahman was a, uh, a critic of the uh, United States government. Sheikh Omar was the nexus, if you like, a point around which a number of Islamic militants gathered. Ramzi Youssef was someone who used the Islamic ideals as a way of gaining other followers. Youssef's attack will target the pinnacles of American wealth and prosperity. The World Trade Center towers were a very visible picture of America's affluence and our power. He felt that that was the most effective way of killing the most people uh, in one place at one time. His terrorist cell assembled. Youssef puts the plan into action. He assembled the chemicals. He built the bomb. They drove from their base in New Jersey across into Manhattan. They parked illegally uh, in the car park by one of the main pillars. And Ramsey Yusuf climbed into the back using a cheap cigarette lighter, um, ignited the fuses, which were um, designed to burn for a while before exploding. They jumped into a second vehicle and exited the building. Ramsey Yosef went back over to New Jersey. He stood up on the waterfront opposite um, southern Manhattan and watched what happened. And I have no doubt that he was very disappointed when uh, the, the, the Twin Towers didn't collapse. If he had been able to place the vehicle just a little bit further down the ramp, uh, adjacent to the load-bearing column, he would have been able to do that. Though his accomplices would quickly fall into the FBI net, Youssef had planned his escape. He left right away. He left actually the night of the bombing. He began traveling, but Ramsey was a man on the run. He vanished, and it began a, a very intense fugitive investigation. We knew his roots went back to the uh, uh, Pakistan-Afghanistan border. The U.S. Diplomatic Security Service immediately enlists their Pakistani contacts in the hunt. It was a multi-agency operation, and uh, members of uh, different law enforcement agencies participated in it. March 3rd, a raid for Yousef is launched in Quetta, Pakistan. Scott Ramsey. It was a very close call for us. We were probably within just a couple of hours of taking him. When we passed the information to the Pakistani authorities. Ramsey became aware of it and fled. Yusuf was helped by um, some senior members of Pakistani intelligence. The Pakistanis just simply couldn't trust everyone. While one branch of the government was trying to locate him, there were elements within uh, the Pakistani government who were assisting him. They believed in what he was doing. They were angry against America. Aided by a vast terrorist network, Yousef is virtually untouchable in Pakistan. It's extremely hard to go and root out known terrorists in this country. Pakistani police trace Yousef to a place where he knows the U.S. agents will be unable to track him. We were looking for him in Peshawar. Peshawar has always been known as a Wild West town. So a town that a lot of smugglers, a lot of underground types have used as a resting place. Peshawar is qualitatively different 
from all other cities of Pakistan. It's surrounded by what is called the tribal areas. You can just get anything there. People walk around with guns, and so it's easy for people to hide. Very hard for American agents to operate there, and very easy for somebody like Ramzi Yusuf to hide there and use it as a base from which to flit across the border into Afghanistan. From Peshawar, Yusuf slips across the lawless Khyber Pass into Afghanistan. And in Afghanistan, he was able to work in some of the terror training camps there and is believed to have uh, given lectures and taught people about explosives in those camps. March 4, 1994, a New York jury finds Youssef's conspirators, Muhammad Salameh, Nidal Ayad, Mahmoud Abu Halima, and Ahmed Ajas, guilty of murder in the World Trade Center bombing. Each received 240 years in prison. So we were doing two things at the same time, prosecuting the initial four people that were charged and looking for Ramzi Yosef. With no trace of Yusuf, the State Department enlists a new tactic. As a means of trying to locate uh, Ramzi Yusuf, the US State Department runs a rewards program offering vast sums of money if people will turn in uh, wanted terrorists. We were putting up a number of posters around the embassy, certainly willing to talk to anybody that was willing to come to the embassy gate. But with agents scouring Pakistan, Yusuf has quietly slipped out of the country. Ramzi Yusuf was still keen uh, to commit further terrorist acts. Yusuf will build a devastating bomb to target the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok, Thailand. March 1994, the world's most wanted terrorist Kuwaiti-born Ramzi Youssef has avoided capture for over a year. Even after he'd launched this, this huge attack against the United States, Ramzi Youssef was still keen uh, to commit further terrorist acts. With authorities searching Pakistan, <laughs> Ramzi Youssef slips into Bangkok, Thailand and begins plotting a new assault. Yusuf was building a terrorist cell of like-minded individuals he could rely on. Some of them had uh, quite effective covers. They were local businessmen or they were working, they were running shops, things like that. But at the same time, Ramzi Yusuf was living the high life as well. Ramzi Yusuf was uh, uh, very westernized. He liked the nightlife. Uh, he liked to go out. He was not a religious individual. The girlfriends he had were uh, bar girls. Uh, not exactly what I would say within the confines of a strict uh, Muslim man. And yet they were prepared to commit these terrible atrocities in the name of Islam. Youssef's audacious plan would target the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok. The main thrust of this attack was a, was a huge truck bombing that was planned. General Santicope of the Bangkok police is confronted with a terrorist plot. <laughs> They drove their truck out into the city at 9 o'clock in the morning. March 11, 1994. Approaching the U.S. Embassy, the truck turns onto Bangkok's busy Chitlam Road. The driver collided with a motorcyclist. The guy who was driving the van had uh, uh, crashed into um, some sort of motorcycle taxi and got out of the cab and started panicking. There were people coming out of a local department store. There was a, uh, a crowd growing and he heard sirens in the distance. The driver said he was going to make a phone call, but he ran away. So he ran off. The police arrived to find all this confusion. Bangkok police impound the truck. They drove the van without knowing that it had a bomb in the back. We brought the truck back and parked it in front of the police station. Thai police locate the owner of the truck. The driver of the truck had reported the truck missing, but when he arrived at the station, he immediately noticed a huge water tank on the truck that did not belong to him. He arrived and opened the back and found a huge bomb in the back. They found eight packs of C4 and the tank full of ammonia fertilizer. If someone had started the car and put on electricity, everything would have had a bone up. 
As the bomb squad defuses the bomb, they make another startling discovery. We opened the trunk and we found a dead body wrapped in a canvas. The decomposing body of the person that uh, Ramsey Yusuf had hired the van from. And it was when the, the Thai police were, were examining the bomb and brought in forensics experts that they discovered uh, at least one of Ramsey Yusuf's fingerprints on it and were able to um, tell the FBI that the FBI, one of the FBI's most wanted guys had been trying to launch this bomb attack in Bangkok. By the time the manhunt has moved to Bangkok, Youssef has already fled back to Pakistan. Ramzi Youssef's terrorist star was in ascendance in, in the Far East. As I say, he, he was almost something of a terrorist celebrity. Among those drawn to Youssef is a young African militant. Ishtiak Parker was a young South African Muslim who was studying in Pakistan. Um, he was introduced to Ramzi Youssef um, by mutual acquaintance. Parker's South African passport will allow Youssef's new recruit to travel freely. And Ramzi Youssef, quite quickly it seems, decided that he was going to try and recruit Parker. Youssef also attracts the attention of terror's upper echelon. He did have associations with, with Afghanistan, with the people that were connected with Osama bin Laden, that he was part of uh, the early part of al-Qaeda. Osama bin Laden provided him with financial funding for him to then travel to the Philippines to train a group called Abu Sayyaf, which operates in the southern Philippines. It's a particularly bloodthirsty, violent group. Philippines had porous borders at the time, and they could slip in and out easily. Ramzi Yusuf uh, provided them with terrorist weapons training. He, he taught them how to use explosives, how to operate as terrorists. From the southern islands, Yusuf travels to Manila. In a city of 11 million, it's going to be hard to find um, an individual like that. He could fit in anywhere. His linguistic ability was very um, well developed and he was able to assume almost as a chameleon. Yusef and his cell frequent the sex bars of Manila's Makati district. In Manila, one of his collaborators, a guy called Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, um, who also happens to be his uncle, um, was well known in Manila for wandering around some of the flashy hotels there in a white tuxedo. Through late 1994, Youssef recruits from Manila's Golden Mosque at Kepo, quickly assembling over 20 new followers to implement his most audacious plan of all. He began the Bajinka plot. Bojinka plot, which translated into the big blast. The Bojinka plot was a plan to put uh, bombs on 12 different U.S. airliners. The idea was to have the bombs detonate simultaneously, so it would take out 12 747s at the same time. To execute his plan, Yusef will need to perfect a bomb versatile enough to be smuggled onto a jet and powerful enough to blow it out of the sky. So the device Ramsey Yusuf developed was particularly ingenious. He basically developed a, a form of liquid, undetectable nitroglycerin. It was odorless. It could be hidden in a contact lens solution bottle. He used a, uh, a Casio data bank watch that had been modified. It had an improvised blasting cap on it and a connector for a 9-volt battery. He could just take his wristwatch off and drop it in the little tray and, and have it taken around the metal detector. And once he got on the plane, he could assemble the device and then set the timer. He spent a long time preparing this and uh, developing it for use to, uh, to bring down U.S. airliners. Jojo Capacetti heads the Manila Bomb Squad. Uh, they tested all these kinds of chemical explosives here in Manila, and one of these explosives were uh, tested here at the Greenbelt Theater. Though no one was injured, the bomb had exploded precisely when and how Ramsey had predicted. December 8, 1994. Yusef checks into the Donna Josefa apartments on President Quirino Boulevard. Two days later, Yusef boards a plane at Manila Airport. Philippine Airline Flight 434 in December of 1994. Uh, basically, this was a, 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 tr a test run. 
He got onto the plane, he sat down in his seat, acted very normal, then he got up during the course of the flight, went to the toilet, assembled his bomb, went back to his seat, tucked the bomb under the, the seat and then just got off in Cebu. PAL Flight 434 is scheduled for a brief layover in Cebu. A Japanese national by the name of Haruki Ikegami. He was uh, just an innocent businessman, a traveler. Uh, he had sat down in the seat where Yosef had placed the bomb after Yosef had gotten off the air airliner. During the course of that flight, the bomb exploded underneath him with pretty horrifying results. It blew out part of the side of the plane. It devastated um, Ikigami's body. It was only really uh, a matter of luck, I think, that the, the plane was able to divert and land as opposed to um, falling out of the sky into the, into the sea. Ed Gatumbato of the Manila Police is the lead Filipino investigator. We were able to recover parts of the improvised explosive device, uh, two pieces of nine volts battery, and the other one is the Cashew Watts with a strap. So we were able to relate that all these bombings now are attributed to the international terrorists. They alerted the FBI, of course. It soon became clear that it was probably Ramzi Youssef who'd been the, the guy who built it and had sat in the seat. They were able to work this out from fingerprints at the travel agency where he purchased the tickets and also from some of the air stewardesses who recognized his photo when it was shown to them. January 1994, emboldened by the success of the test, Ramzi Youssef returns to Manila's Josefa apartments to finalize the Bajinka plot. After he proved that his liquid nitroglycerin bombs would work, um, he realized he had to just make them slightly more powerful to be able to bring down um, airliners. It was a very complicated plot. 12 different operatives to get on 12 different planes at specific times, get off at specific times, and to set the timers on the explosive devices to function at specific times. Youssef and his associates begin building 12 bombs to simultaneously bring down 12 747s, the most deadly terrorist act in history. The apartment in the Philippines was a bomb factory. In December 1994, Fugitive terrorist Ramzi Youssef plots to simultaneously blow 12 commercial airliners out of the sky. The bombs would be detonated and the planes would have fallen out of the sky into the Pacific. Um, Youssef hired an apartment in Manila and began mixing chemicals. He began preparing these bombs. Room 603 at Manila's Donna Josefa apartment complex has been transformed into a bomb factory. It started to go wrong for him and a small fire started in his apartment. Yusuf and one of his uh, collaborators tried to put it out themselves, and when they realized they were gonna have problems, um, they uh, left the apartment and tried to prevent other people from going into it. Thick smoke begins to pour from room 603. There was a security guard at the apartments who forced his way in. He could see a load of chemicals and the fire brigade were alerted. When the investigators turned up, they were looking at the contents of this room and finding an array of terrorist uh, equipment. The explosive ingredients, the chemicals, the timer for cooking, the books, dictionaries, formulas. Ramzi Youssef was um, just down the block watching what was going on with his uh, conspirator, uh, Abdul Hakim Murad. He sent Murad back in. He ordered him basically, you've got to go back in there and get the laptop and, and try and get as much out of there as you can. Murad nearly got away with it, but he was captured by the Filipino police. Philippine authorities seize Murad and begin leaning on him. Mered was interrogated pretty extensively, and he began revealing details of, uh, of what was being planned. We were able to relate all these pieces of evidence together, and it turned out that it was the signature of the Ramsey Youssef. Philippine police notify the FBI. 
We sent teams of agents. The apartment in the Philippines was a, was a pivotal point in the investigation. The most astounding information is contained on the terrorist's computer. And we were able to determine what the conspirators, Ramzi Yosef and his compatriots, were planning. The audacity of the plan only underscores the need to catch Yusef before he strikes again. Two of his other conspirators were detained. Ramzi Yosef slipped away. After this huge plot to kill thousands of people had been discovered in the Philippines, um, Yusuf is again on the run. Um, he's been on the run for um, nearly two years now, and he flees back to Pakistan. He renews his acquaintance with uh, Ishtiak Parker. Yusuf takes Parker back to Bangkok. The terrorist will use his young recruit as an instrument for swift revenge. Ramzi Yusuf uh, tells him to go and buy some hard-bodied suitcases, some hard-shell suitcases. Um, he goes and does this. He also buys some clothes that can be used to put in, in the suitcase around the bomb just as cover for the device. And the source was carrying all the explosives. Ramsey was clean. Uh, of course, wanted to make sure that there was nothing on him that would incriminate him in case he was stopped. Parker starts to have doubts about this. Um, he's very scared of Ramzi Youssef. He's not uh, as militant as Ramzi Youssef by any means, and he's not convinced that killing several hundred people is a very good idea. Parker makes an excuse and convinces Youssef to abort the plan. Parker is now very scared of Ramzi Youssef. He's very worried about what he's going to be expected to do next. The terrorist sends his young recruit back to Pakistan with new marching orders. Parker's having none of this. He spots a US magazine on sale and on a newsstand, um, which indicates there's a, a multi-million dollar reward out for Ramsey Yusuf's capture. The State Department's rewards program is about to pay off. If anybody turns this guy in, they can be rich for the rest of their lives. And in the case of Ramsey Yusuf, it seemed to work because this was one of the main reasons um, Ishtiak Parker contacted the US Embassy. February 3rd, we received a telephone call from a female embassy employee that somebody was in her front yard acting a little strange, very nervous, very scared, and had a, a U.S. magazine, Newsweek or, or Time magazine, rolled up in his hand. I then responded to the house uh, to, to see what was going on in essence, and at first we chalked it up to someone just who wanted some money. Initially, the, the DSS agents who received the telephone calls from Ishtiak Parker were a little bit suspicious because they'd had a lot of uh, crazies coming out of the woodwork. For his own safety, the DSS agents spirit Parker inside the U.S. Embassy for further questioning. He began to speak of a laptop computer. He gave us physical characteristics that only someone in close and recent contact with him uh, would be aware of. He had mentioned a number of very fairly specific details. I realized that he wasn't just the flake. The information that he gave us was all proof positive that he knew Ramsey Yusuf. The FBI task force is put on alert. We did get word that if somebody had come into the embassy over in Islamabad and had some information uh, about Ramsey Yusuf. The FBI decides to scramble an assault team to Pakistan. They needed to get some sort of elite, heavily armed team out into Pakistan to work with the local Pakistani authorities to try and capture Yusuf. After all, he was one of the most wanted men in the world, but events moved too quickly in Pakistan. Parker informs the agents that Yusuf is again on the move. Yusuf announced that he was going to get on a bus and leave the city, so then Parker slipped away and managed to pass this information to the US Embassy. At that point in time, it, it, the operation really took on a whole life of its own. The embassy realized things were moving too quickly. They had to, they had to capture Yusuf immediately. The DSS agents must work with the terrified informant without the aid of the FBI task force. This is in the midst of Ramadan, so he's fasting. He's got low blood sugar and a very uh, uh, short wire as a result of that, on top of being extremely nervous. Yusuf is to board a bus for Peshawar. The DSS realized he must be prevented from reaching the tribal region. He would have been gone because he would have fled. He would have gone into Peshawar from Peshawar over the Khyber Pass into Afghanistan. They worked as a small team and staked out the bus terminal. While American and Pakistani agents stake out the bus terminal, the informant again makes contact. 
we received a telephone call from the informant saying that his uh, Yusuf had changed his plans. He's not going to the bus station now. We're going up later. But then it was realized that Ramzi Yusuf actually wasn't going to leave on a bus. He was actually staying in a guest house. He's at the Sukasa Hotel. He's going to take a nap in a few minutes. Again, we moved over towards the Sukasa. The embassy immediately requests the aid of Pakistani law enforcement. The uh, ambassador asked for their immediate assistance in response to the Sakasa guest house and explained to them that we had very good reason to believe that Ramzi Yusuf was in country, that uh, we thought we would be able to take him very soon. We all put our heads together and identified that this was our target. This was the World Trade Center bomber. They blanketed the area with everything they had. DSS agents and Pakistani police stake out the Sukasa guest house overnight. At daybreak, they put their plan into action. They arranged for Ishtiak Parker to go into the building and uh, check that he was still there. He was to take a ball cap that he had off of his head and rub his right hand through his, uh, through his hair a couple of times. That was the sign to us that indeed Yusuf was in there. February 1995, Islamabad, Pakistan. After a two-year international manhunt, terrorist Ramzi Youssef is nearly in the crosshairs of U.S. law enforcement. There was a team of uh, Pakistani agents and American agents staking out the Sukasa guest house in Islamabad where Ramzi, Ramzi Youssef was thought to be. There was a very real possibility that we might be able to finally capture this guy, Ramzi Youssef. Uh, in Pakistan, but we had to do it very, very carefully. U.S. Embassy DSS agents send former Yusef associate turned informant Ishtiak Parker inside to mark their target. I had prearranged with the informant to go across the street, go into the guest house. Ishtiak Parker went up to his room. He established that Yusef was certainly still there and appeared to be building yet more bombs and stuffing explosives into remote controlled children's cars. If indeed Yusuf was in his room, once they finished, he was supposed to come out. He was to take a ball cap that he had off of his head and rub his right hand through his, uh, through his hair. Parker came out of the building. He ran his hand through his hair to indicate that Yusuf was there. And the uh, American and Pakistani agents began their raid. I went to the front door. And the Pakistani authorities went in first. Where is room 16? They shouted. They began swarming up the stairs. American agents with their hands on their guns. Pakistani agents already with their guns in their hands leading the way. They gathered outside room 16. ISI broke through the door. Ramsey was on his bed uh, asleep. Probably had been asleep for only a few minutes. They jerked him out of bed, threw him up against the window. I spread his legs and then checked his identity. The ISI agents uh, kept control of him. He was very compliant. One of the Pakistani agents said, is this the guy you're after? Didn't open his eyes, didn't utter a sound. Well, finally, I gestured to the ISI agent to turn his face to me. I pulled out a picture I had in my, uh, my jacket, and I held it up next to his head. And he looked at me, I looked at him, and uh, I looked at the brigadier, and I said, that's him. And I said, what's up, Ramsey? It was the first time he'd heard English spoken that morning, and he realized that the Americans were there. The feared Pakistani ISI take immediate custody of Youssef. The ISI agent went back around and pinched Ramsey on the neck and said, uh, the Americans will go home tonight, but I will stay with you. And I think Ramsey then had a little moment of truth. His eyes filled with tears. Uh, his knees basically went out from under him. standard policy is to let the host country have him for a little while so that they can set fire to his toes and things like that. They put a black hood over his head and hustled him out of the building. To convince the Pakistanis to allow Yusuf's extradition to the US, the DSS agents must revert back to their mission of diplomacy. We were able to put the pressure on the Pakistani government that was appropriate without embarrassing them, but at the same time, making sure that they gave us Ramzi Yusuf. 
Benazir Bhutto, the, the Pakistani leader, agreed that Ramzi Yusuf could be flown out of uh, Pakistan and returned to America to stand trial, which was difficult for her to do because there, was, um, there were militants in her own government who weren't happy about cooperating with America. In order to ensure American jurisdiction, Yusuf must be flown directly to American soil. With their cooperation, we were able to send a team of agents to Pakistan um, covertly to bring him back to stand trial here in the United States. During the long flight home, the FBI agents get inside Yusef's head. We covered the whole gamut of his, of his terrorist activities. The Manila Air plot, the Bojinka plot, and the World Trade Center plot, questions about other plots in, in the Philippines. He was proud of what he did and was really anxious to tell us how he did it. Finally, the terrorist transport plane touches down in the U.S. He was flown back to Stewart Airport in upstate New York, and uh, from there he was flown by helicopter, transferred into a helicopter under very heavy armed guard. The final leg will take Youssef through lower Manhattan. It was a very clear night. I'll never forget it. It was just crystal clear. We wanted to make sure uh, that he was flown back past the World Trade Center uh, at night with the lights bright flashing boldly in the early morning hours. We came right down the Hudson River and of course you know, at the, the base of Manhattan uh, where the Twin Towers all lit up. The hood that was over his head was taken off of him and uh, we wanted to make sure that he was told that there are the towers, that they're still standing. Ramzi Yusuf just leaned forward and sort of smirked a little bit. He says, if I had had more time and more money, I could have taken them down. You know, and then the helicopter came around the, came around the towers and landed. And it's quite a chilling comment, I think, because really, just as uh, Ramzi Yusuf had failed to bring down the towers in 93, his collaborators in Al-Qaeda didn't lose sight that they really wanted to bring down those towers and they came back a number of years later and of course in 2001 we saw the uh, atrocity they were able to inflict. The first World Trade Center bombing really made people realize that we here in the United States um, are at risk, we're targets and we've been attacked a lot since then. February 12, 1997, Ramzi Youssef is sentenced to 240 years to life in the federal supermax prison in Florence, Colorado. He will serve his sentence in virtual solitary confinement. But the grueling manhunt to capture the World Trade Center bomber would soon become a footnote to a much bigger tragedy. There were people that thought the World Trade Center bombing of 1993 was a one-time event. It wasn't. The attack on September the 11th of 2001 on the World Trade Center was probably the culmination of the original plan. In the wake of 9-11 and the subsequent pursuit of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Osama bin Laden, and many other Ramzi Youssef associates in the Al-Qaeda network, the successful hunt loses much of its luster. There were enough of Ramsey's compatriots still left in the country, and the majority of the focus was put on Ramsey Yusuf. I think that that was probably one of the chief mistakes at the time, was the focus on Ramsey and not on the wider um, issue of how Ramsey got to where he was at. The commitment has to be there, otherwise it will be like a monster where you cut off a head, and the head will grow back and continue to be there. Unless you could kill it, and kill it from its origin, it will reinvent itself in a different form. Yet the attacks on New York and Washington created a commitment, unprecedented in modern history, for the West to individually target its enemies. I would go after anybody that would hurt the United States, and I would do it without a paycheck. The U.S. in particular has displayed a memory that is unrelenting, and a reach that is global. If you cross that line, if you uh, take it upon yourself to Go after the United States in any way, shape, or form. We will hunt you down. And we won't stop until we get you. 